You are once again tuned in to the Louisville South Charge YouTube service. Hello and welcome. My name is Reverend Keith Williams, pastor of the Louisville South Charge, including Campground, Flower Ridge, and Rocky Hill Churches. Today's service is for Sunday, August 23rd, 2020, fourth Sunday in the month of uh, August. Uh, on the liturgical, liturgical calendar, 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we are in the long summer months. We are looking forward to resuming in-person worship beginning first Sunday in September, September 6th. A quick reminder that we will be following all guidelines for public gathering, including wearing masks, social distancing, all the things that we have become so familiar with during this COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, there are a few more uh, guidelines for gathering at church. The most disturbing is that there will be no congregational singing. In fact, only one or two people will be allowed to sing simultaneously, and they must be 25 feet away from the nearest person. Um, loud speaking! Uh, also falls into the same category as singing, so I will try to remain 25 feet away from the nearest person when I am preaching. We will make every attempt to have, this is another one of the recommendations, to have doors and windows open for ventilation, uh, but here's the deal. Some church windows, uh, especially stained glass windows, are not made to open. And then some uh, church windows don't budge. Uh, trust, trust me, from my experience, them, some of them won't, uh, even when they're supposed to. So, we'll see. In addition to in-person worship, we will also make drive-in worship possible using a radio transmitter uh, in the comfort of your own vehicles. Uh, sound will be coming over your FM radio. And if all else fails, we will still record our worship service. Even on those days, we, we started this, we did this. If you'll look back, we've recorded every service since we've started. And you know, there's a certain number of Sundays there where very low uh, views. That's because most people showed up for church on those Sundays. But uh, like I said, if all else fails, we will still record our worship service and it will be available for viewing later, not on Sunday morning like we are right now, but uh, later on this YouTube channel. So you've got options here. In person worship inside the building with us, uh, drive in worship. Uh, remaining in the safety of your vehicle, or I don't know, you can you can wait for the movie. All right, in the news, there have been some improvements in the numbers this past week. Uh, you know, especially here in the state of Mississippi. But uh, as we say, really nothing to write home about. Uh, I think school openings. And the results over the next couple of weeks, I think that that will get our attention. As I saw, I think reported this week, uh, Notre Dame opened for a week just to close right back down. So, I don't know. Let's continue to pray for positive results. I think most of us think that for our kids... Uh, going to school, attending class in person, just like it is in person worship, that that's, uh, that that's very significant for us, very important. And then, uh, coming up, first weekend in September, you know, right about the time we get started back, we've got 
Labor Day holiday weekend uh, coming up here. Uh, for lots of folks, that's the final bash of summer or whatever. So, again, let's pray that folks stay safe and smart as we celebrate Labor Day uh, weekend and Labor Day on Monday, September 7th. So, uh, first of the month things about to take place. Uh, and that will include for us on first Sunday, uh, on our first Sunday back, September 6th, we will celebrate Holy Communion. Okay, also in the news are all of the various reports about the development and testing of vaccines. Uh, I heard the number, it was hundreds of vaccines are now in, in process being tested. Uh, and then there was another very interesting news report I heard this past week. Uh, you see, you got doctors and scientists, I guess those are sort of interchangeable here, uh, who are working on a vaccine. Uh, and as I understand the data, a vaccine in this sense is viewed as a short-term solution. More interesting, uh, there are other groups of doctors and scientists who are working on a more, uh, what they call a long-term solution. And as this uh, news report indicated, the long-term solution is some kind of super vaccine uh, that covers all the types of coronavirus, uh, SARS and MERS, you know, all of these have acronyms for different things, and will even provide protection for some types of rhinoviruses. You remember we had this conversation way back in church earlier that part of the problem of coronavirus is that it's first cousin, some of them second cousin, to uh, rhinoviruses, which is the common cold, and we know the problem of that. So, um, anyway, the news is, is that it will, this super vaccine, will even provide protection from some types of rhinoviruses. So, if you didn't hear this on the news, yes, you heard it here first. Uh, maybe out of all of this craziness, there may come the cure for some varieties, not all, but some varieties of the common cold. So, that sounds like good news. So, as we've uh, said many times, uh, I would say every time we pray for a cure, for a vaccine, uh, for eventually, maybe even a super vaccine that is safe and effective. Now, another always, uh, the importance of praying for our leadership. Uh, church, local, state, nation, and world. Remember that this is a pandemic that involves everybody. Uh, even remember that there are still places in our world, because of COVID-19, they are still in a bad way. I mean, there's still places that they haven't got a handle on this thing yet. I mean, not at all, N not even close to what we and other nations have done. Uh, you know, places in our world that they won't get a handle on this. Places where this virus thing will just have to uh, play through, so to speak. Uh, no guidelines, you know, no masks, no, no real medical facilities. Uh, so, another thing that I s quite often say is we are a blessed people. We are a blessed nation. We gather freely and without consequence as the body of Christ. We are the church. We are sitting on the rock. 
we have made and come to understand the foundational acknowledgement that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. We grow like Peter. We grow and mature together in our Christian understandings. I invite you to claim your faith. It's an attitude of life. As we've said, discovering how to act in faith, believing, knowing that we will be sustained. We believe in prayer. As always, we pray for friends and family. We celebrate good news and answered prayers on the Louisville South Charge. Answered prayers happen when God's will and our will align. We pray for all those on our prayer list. Uh, we got three. Uh, so, we have arrived at that time when I ask you to join me in prayer. Think about those special to you. Think about those prayer requests that may be known only to you. Lift them in prayer. I invite you to join me as we bow in reverence. In conclusion, uh, join me in the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that is ours by calling his name, Jesus. Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, justify me. Jesus, sanctify me. The Christ living in us helps us to see that Jesus is the one. Father, hear all the things we would pray for. Thanksgiving, supplication, intercession, and praise. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our people. We pray for the sick. We pray for the recovering. We pray for the lonely. And we pray a special blessing for all those who do not call you by name. Jesus, you are Lord. We surrender our will, our lives to you. Father, give us the ability to listen to the Christ within us. Holy God, as we pray, Hear those we name in our hearts. Father, bless the leadership decisions that are being made on behalf of us all. Bless all of those on our prayer list. Father, bless our neighbors whose name we do not know yet. Bless us this day through the reading of Scripture and its proclamation. Bless us, Father, as we plan to open the doors and the windows if we can and gather as your church, the body of Christ. All these things we lift to you in the name, in the most important name of Jesus. And now, Father, let us again unite our voices as we pray the prayer taught by Jesus himself, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, what's in a name? What's in a name? Today, we move forward in our series reading in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, now, y'all know uh, I, I tend to take a break from the series every now and again and oftentimes wander back to the Old Testament. But today's lesson in Matthew is a very significant event where clarity of mind and soul arrives for Simon. In fact, it is such clarity of understanding that Jesus decides to mark the occasion by changing his name so that Simon, in Matthew's 16th chapter, is renamed by Jesus Petra, the rock, or as we call him, Peter, Simon Peter. So, let the name calling begin. Some say John the Baptist, come back from the dead. Others say uh, Elijah. Maybe it's Jeremiah. Or are you no one of them prophets? So, draw near. Who do folks say that I am? Uh, uh, better yet, who do you Say, I am. Did you hear? Did you act? Did you build on the rock? And oh yeah, what's in a name? Reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, <clears throat> verses 13 through 20. Matthew 16, beginning with verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah. And, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, Petra, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God and we say thanks be to God. So, what's in a name? What's in a name? What are the results of what we call each other? What we name each other? What's in a name? When, uh, I don't know, Jesus was called by many names. Some of them good, some of them not. 
And Jesus, uh, in, uh, in certain situations, uh, was a name caller himself. Again, some good, uh, some not so good. When we start naming, we do it for pretty much uh, two reasons. We want to do the right thing. Be uh, Christ-like in our naming. Or we want to do or for whatever reason cannot help but do the wrong thing. I mean, we're either for the person we're naming or we're against the person we're naming. Now, how we go about that makes all the difference in the world. Whether we're trying to do the right thing or the wrong thing. Now, as a, as a minister... Uh, a lot of my experience, naturally, is with church folks. And the same thing occurs. The same reasons for name-calling. Quite often, when you move to a new appointment, you know, because you, you don't know folks. And, you know, it, it takes time. It takes time. Um, but I've had members with very Christ-like intentions, uh, do a little name calling, yeah, to help the new preacher out. Now, I'm going to tell you some of the name calling when you, when you move into a new community, uh, it's just, it's just the wrong thing, y'all. I mean, it's, 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 it's mean, there's uh there's jealousy you you can feel the hate uh it, it's not christ like uh, i mean the ways and the means just seem all wrong you know and it in no way feels like what jesus would do what Jesus would say. You know, there's just some actions, some ways of being in our Christ-like, some things that we cannot adopt, you know. There are just certain things that because of our faith, because of our love, we just cannot participate in. Can't do it. One of my sayings is, uh, you, you can't be a terrorist. You just can't be a terrorist. See if this, this, this is, see if this helps you to understand where I'm coming from. All right. All of us know that the United States has been at war for I don't know how long. A war with terrorists. I mean, it's an ongoing thing. It's going to be an ongoing thing. Now, all of us who have been paying attention... We know that the real problem confronting this issue is that from a certain point of view, as the United States of America, from all the other nations looking at us, watching us, and how we conduct our affairs against these terrorists, our hands are tied, y'all. Why? Why? Because we are unable to play by the same rules as the terrorists. As a nation under God, we should be, we are unable to deceive with lies and half-truths. We are unable because of our moral foundations to Go after them the way they come after us. Mm -mm. You can't be a terrorist. See, we're not, as the United States of America, we're not going to go hijack some airplane and fly it into a building. 
We, we are unable to set off homemade little pipe bombs that are out there just to maim and kill folks. That's all they're for. If we do, then we lower ourselves to the level of the terrorist. And then we're no more justified than them. There's no difference between us and them. You can't be a terrorist. Your standard is in a name. And the name is Jesus Christ. So, what's in a name? What's in a name? What's in a name? Well, we're we're uh, we're we're all up in our uh, political minds at this particular time of the year, uh, present day with all of the events going on. Uh, we we got a election coming up in uh, November, just around the corner, just around the corner. Former Vice President Joe Biden was officially nominated this week. Uh, so, like I said, this is an election year. Uh, there's some name calling going on. So, what's in a name? Well, here's you uh, illus a political illustration, since we all up in our political minds. Here is you a political illustration that you may recall. I'm sure all of y'all remember that there was this dear lady down in the hometown of Crawford, Texas. Yeah, this was back when President uh, George W. Bush was uh, then president. And, of course, we were all up in Afghanistan and Iraq and all of that that was going on, the war against the terrorists and so forth and so on. And, unfortunately, this woman, I don't know if you remember this, it was the national news, there. That was, it, it stirred up a, a little bit. But this lady, um, unfortunately, her son had been killed in Iraq. And she reacted, or I guess you could say she overreacted, with some name-calling. Now, I know that at that particular point, and any time we ever go off to war or battle or anything, there's always within our country some kind of anti-war movement. And this lady had become uh, the new rallying point for the anti-war movement at this particular time. But you know, and I, and I understand that. But what disturbs me so much about all of this is the name by which she called the President of the United States. And I mean, you know, I, I start thinking when, I'm, when it comes to the President that, you know, there's, there's a certain respect that I think is imbued by being the President. Uh, I don't care who the individual person who that may be, he or she. But yeah, this uh, this lady, she was doing some name calling, and um, do you remember what was the name? Well, President Bush was called at that particular time the greatest terrorist on planet Earth. And I mean, y'all, this thing took off. I don't know if you remember they had that on posters. You know, that greatest terrorist on the planet Earth, on T-shirts, and there was Bush's picture. I don't know. You remember this? And what's really disturbing about all of this is that I think some of these people really believe this. I mean, some even some, even some good church folks, you know. And we can't help but begin to think well, you know, maybe there is something to all of this. I mean, you know, we, we went into a rat. We didn't find any weapons of mass destruction and this and that and so forth. And I don't know, maybe the president is a terrorist. And, you know, even if we finally convince ourselves that this is not <laughs> really true, 
The damage has been done, you know? The thought has been put into our heads. And because of the name calling, we can never unthink it. Never. And those of us standing around listening to the name calling, our judgments are clouded. Our judgments are confused. And we begin to doubt the truth and consider the untruth. So, what's in a name? Well, speaking of the presidential uh, election that's taken place, I, I, I remember seeing one of those editorial, you know, political cartoons in the newspaper. This was back years and years ago with the presidential primaries. And uh, the cartoon played off at the time, this is years ago, uh, the popular TV game show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? So that at this particular time in the cartoon, they they have this uh, Regis-looking guy, bless his soul, Regis, just, just, just passed away not too long ago. But anyway, they got this Regis-looking fella uh, asking all of the anonymous uh, candidates, you know, in the, in the tradition of who wants to be a millionaire, the question is, who wants to be the president? And, you know, it's a very thought-provoking little cartoon because we realize that for the most part, whoever gives the most convincing answer to the question, whoever articulates what's going on in our thinking, usually gets the job, whether their answers or, or their promises are real or not. In fact, in the last several elections through most of my lifetime, we elect presidents who say things and we expect them just to say it, just to get elected. We don't expect them to ever be able to follow through on any of their promises, right? So it's a very thought-provoking thing. The most convincing answer to the question. Well, see, in our gospel text this morning, we find Jesus putting a question to the disciples. I mean, it seems to be uh, an appropriate question because the disciples are starting to realize the special connection that Jesus has to God. I mean, come on, you can't live with, travel with, minister with Jesus Christ for nearly three years without things becoming self-evident, you know? So, it's a good question Jesus asked his disciples. What's the question? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do other folks say that I am? This is the question that Jesus asked his disciples. Now, I would, I would say that that is something of an ingenious place for Jesus to start. Because we're far more ready to talk about other people. You know, the, the mild gossip of the day. Some of us get a little bit heavy in the gospel, right? In the gossip. The gossip of the day. Then we are to voice our own opinions. I mean, as long as we can say... Well, you know, oh, so-and-so said this, and or so-and-so over there said that. We feel a level of personal protection, a level of personal dis detachment. You know what I mean? 
And I mean, anyway, after the, the gossip has really turned ugly, we can always back away and say, well, that's what they said. I mean, I, I don't think that. But you know, evidently, the disciples had considered for themselves a whole lot of what other people were thinking. I mean, it was in their heads. They couldn't unthink it, you know? So, let the name calling begin. Uh, some say you're John the Baptist, come back to life. Or maybe even that crazy uh, what, Elijah. Or that fellow that was so hard, Jeremiah. Or I don't know, one of the other prophets. Well, I don't know, not a bad assessment. Since Jesus was often unwelcome within his own community as his prophetic predecessors had been. In fact, it's something of a reoccurring phenomenon. Many prophets of God get run out of town on a rail, so to speak, when the name calling begins. But an ingenious question to start with. Who do other folks say I am? But, you know, now that I've got you guys to talking, here comes the real question. Mm, don't ask the audience. Don't phone a friend. No lifelines. But who do you say I am? Well, Simon who usually, you know, waded right in without first thinking to even test the water, plunged in saying, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, thinking again of the game show, who wants to be a millionaire? It's, it's time for Regis or Meredith or whoever you remember being the host to ask, final answer, Final answer? Congratulations, Simon. You figured it all out. Not from any audience help. You didn't use your 50-50. In fact, all of your lifelines are still available. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So, what happened? How do you see through all the name calling? How did Simon, son of Jonah, do it? So, not surprisingly, the Christ, this is the way I think about it, the Christ living in Simon, helps him to see that Jesus is the one through whom, through whom we connect to what is outside of us, that which is beyond us, that which seems distant to us, but is in reality very much within us very much among us. Personally, I feel something of the same way. When it comes to who Keith is, when it comes to who you are, any of us, in our communities, in, in our churches, uh, when I move into a new situation, you know, you can listen to the name calling, or you can listen to the Christ within you. You can listen to the name calling or you can listen to the Christ within you. I want us to be like Simon Peter. I want us to grow in our understandings. I want us to mature together in our Christian faith. And what's 
what is the most important thing for us to understand? We are one body in Christ. We are the church. We are sitting on that rock that Jesus is talking about. And see, that's where this passage ends. Jesus announces his plans to build the church. Peter has recognized, Simon, I guess we should still call him, has recognized Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. He has been given a glimpse of Jesus' true nature by the grace and power of God, the Father Almighty. In turn, Jesus identifies this disciple by a new name, Petra. Peter. Peter, of course, means rock. But when Jesus announces that on this rock I will build my church, I've thought about that for a long time, and you may differ in your opinion, but here's what I think. Here's my interpretation. Uh, I really don't think that he's referring specifically to Peter, you know, the man. Rather, Jesus is referring to the foundational acknowledgement that Peter makes of Jesus as the Christ. See the difference? It is Peter's confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, on which the church is to be built. That makes more sense to me. I mean, earlier in Matthew, Jesus had already alluded to this very thing. Quote, everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. Now, as far as our personal lives go, I mean, that's all any of us can do. Stand on the rock. What's in a name? More than we know. As for me, I have a confession yeah, a little of my own name calling because in a Christ-like way, yeah, I try. I'm a name caller every once in a while. But yeah, let me do a little name calling. Here it is. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And on that rock, Thank you again for joining us for Sunday, August 23rd. I'm happy to announce that this is the next to the last time that I will have to sit here in front of my phone. You see me. I don't get to see any of you. I have a really good imagination. I hope y'all are watching and paying attention. I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, but all that changes in two weeks. So one more time. Uh, for next Sunday, and then I hope and pray that I don't ever have to do this again. Uh, this is, don't shake, don't shake. It's not very fun. So many things can go wrong. Uh, in other words, when we get back in church in September, I really don't want uh, to do any uh, more backing up. Uh, I pray uh, no more cease and desist from uh, our bishop. Uh, I mean, if we get back into church, I, I want us to stay in church, don't y'all? Right? Uh, but the fall is on the way, and we've heard what we've heard. 
Uh, we've all heard the things uh, that things may get worse over in the fall and winter. So we'll make adjustments as it makes sense and as the situation arises. But for right now, see you at church on Communion Sunday on September 6th. Receive this blessing and this dismissal. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the power that is part of us because of the name of Jesus. Father Christ living in us. When it comes down to faith, when it comes to who we are, sometimes, most times, the world doesn't know. So you can listen to the name calling or you can listen to the Christ within you. Father, may we be given a glimpse of Jesus' true nature. Father, bless us as we plan to come back to church. Bless us, Father, when we represent the church, the body of Christ in all the other places. We're sitting on the rock. Dismiss us in your love. Send us forth in your spirit. God be with you till we meet again. In Jesus' name we do pray, and all God's children say,